Good afternoon, everyone. I have no disclosures. It is a pleasure for me to be here, and I want to welcome you to the new year. I also want to thank you for all that you've been doing um, uh, ever since COVID hit and even before. Uh, it really it does help our patients, and um, I'm sorry that we can't be in person today. That's unfortunate, but uh, hopefully this virtual talk will allow us to connect with equity, diversity, and inclusion and to, to discuss hopeful solutions for that in our own community and with us individually. There are professionals who spend their entire careers actually talking about and creating equity, diversity, and inclusion projects and initiatives. I'm not that person, but this presentation is very important to me because it's very personal. And I'll give you just a couple of statistics about me uh, that makes it so. I um, was and still am the only ever black man who has been a program director at this university. I have been the only surgeon at the Children's Hospital for the last 22 years that I've been there. Uh, I'm one of four full academic um, um, professors uh, who happens to be a black man at this university. And I am one of five academic full black full professors in the country in, your, for in, the, uh, uh, in urology out of thousands of urologists. Uh, and I'm one of six black male DIOs, uh, designated institutional officials out of 1200 sponsoring institutions. So I'm kind of a living, breathing kind of symbol of this uh, presentation, which is really an opportunity. It's also imperative as the designated institutional official that I provide some um, um, intersection with ACGME, RGME community, and UW Medicine's mandates around diversity, healthcare, and safety for our residents and fellows and faculty. So my job today is kind of an enormous one, but we have a limited time. There are many facts um, that we're gonna be talking about um, some problems that we have in our country and in our community, we won't be able to solve all of those, but I'm hoping that everyone will be able to connect a little bit more with equity, diversity, and inclusion through this talk and through their questions. So the key aims are to realize the historical background of racial and social inequities and injustices in the United States, which have led to health disparities for minoritized populations. And that would be Blacks, Latinx, um, transgendered uh, people, uh, handicapped people, etc. We need to determine how uh, improving workforce diversity can mitigate health disparities and recognize what the ACGME is doing to require programs to achieve more equity, diversity, and inclusion in, in graduate medical education communities. We also are going to look at analyzing some solutions, but I'm hoping that more that people take practical solutions and use those to accomplish more diversity uh, to provide a better workforce in our environment. I want to remind everybody that UW Medicine's mission is to improve the health of the public. This is a singular promise and an ambitious uh, promise to take care of everyone in the public. And that means all people. It doesn't mean part of the population. But the problem is that health disparities has historically affected the minoritized public. Um, healthcare disparities can be eliminated by health equity, and one solution to health equity is to increase workforce diversity, and inclusion is that tool. The ACGME mandate also talks about requiring programs to intentionally look at workforce diversity to eliminate health disparities and achieve better health equity. So that we're all on the same page, health equity, according to the CDC, is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her or their full health potential, and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social disposition or other socially determined circumstances. And I wanna remind everyone that health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury or violence, um, or in opportunities to achieve optimal health experienced by socially disadvantaged racial, ethnic, and other populations. We have to remember that minority health determines the health of the nation. And you'll see why, because minorities in this country are increasing at a pace that is outpacing the white population. And here we see from the Committee on Graduate Medical Education, of which I happen to be a member, um, this is um, the difference uh, between um, uh, pop present population race over the next 50 years. 
So if you look at the key on the right, you'll see that non-white, his, non-white, non-Hispanic whites made up 71% of the population in 2000, and by 2050 will make up 52.8%. And you see that Latinx in red is outpacing by 58%, and um, Black Americans will outpace by about 13, uh, thir- by, it will be outpaced by about 25%. And if we look at our own um, corner of the world in our whammy states, the US Census Bureau between 1990 and 2010 had these numbers here with differences, the Hispanic population growing at 31%, Asian and Pacific Islanders at 23%, American Indians at 15% and African Americans at 13% and the white population at 6%. So the number of minority physicians is not keeping pace with uh, the minoritized population growth. Statistics reveal that African Americans, Hispanics and Native Americans make up more than 25% now, this was from 2005, it's 36% of the US population, but only 6% of its physician workforce, this has not changed. And now it's down to only 4.1% of its medical school faculty workforce. And I happen to be one of those medical school workalty, uh, faculty minority workforce. So how did we get to this position where we're not keeping pace with the minoritized populations with regard to the workforce that we have? Well, 150 years ago, this is what a medical school class looked like. It was a proprietary medical school with the proprietor in the long white coat and these were all of his students. There were, no, there were no standard books. There was no standard licensing. All the students were white. All the students were male. There were no women and there were no people of color in these classes. After World War II, women started to be allowed in classes. You can see three women peppered in this class of all white male students. There were no black students in this class in most classes. Harvard and a few other of the elite Um, medical schools were allowing certain minoritized populations in, but not many. 2022 is very different. We see that we have lesbian, transgender, Black, Hispanic, Latinx, handicapped uh, people, but this is still not keeping pace with our minoritized population. So this has been starkly uh, kind of dramatically uh, sent, sent to us with the two pandemics that we're facing right now. And the COVID pandemic, which has been disproportionately uh, killing black and brown uh, people over non-Hispanic whites, um, is um, very clear that there are healthcare disparities in this country. And a lot of that comes from history of racism in this country and institutionalized racism. According to the CDC, racism is the combination of structures, policies, laws, practices, and norms that assign value to and determine opportunities for um, certain people and not others. Uh, And over the summer, we, 2020, which was a a very, very tough summer, um, we saw a lot of problems uh, with um, people striking out spontaneously and randomly against uh, Asians for creating the virus. Uh, We saw Maude Aubrey get shot in the back and George Floyd's neck um, was uh, kneeled upon by a white police officer. Breonna Taylor sleeping in her bed was shot. There was a lot of um, lot of hate going on and still is. Um, and there's evidence of racial and ethnic disparities in our country that the Institute of Medicine has laid bare for us in this 600 uh, page document of unequal treatment, which consistently finds racial and ethnic disparities across a wide range of disease areas and clinical services. It's including public and private teaching and non-teaching hospitals even when clinical factors such as state of disease, presentation, comorbidities, age, severity of disease are considered, and minorities are dying at a much higher rate than non-Hispanic whites. Many of you have seen this diagram before. Equality does not equal equity. If we look at the yellow stick figures, uh, the taller ones um, perhaps having more um, privilege than the shorter ones, and the green boxes, kind of establishing resources. The apples are oper- or, or the benefits are the opportunities that people can receive. You see that if it's equal, if the resources are equally distributed, then not everybody can reach the apples and gain the benefits. But if we have equity where people are who are not as um, privileged 
perhaps, or don't have as many resources, our resource better, then we can all share the apples in the tree and the benefits of, of, of our society. Um, well, there's been some attempt at kind of equalizing um, uh, medicine and, and, the, and the access to medicine in our country. About 100 years ago, uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, called for a national health care uh, reform. And it wasn't until uh, many presidents later, and President Obama in 2009, uh, was the Affordable Care Act passed. Uh, this brings together policy, politics and race and health care. It's interesting that the U.S. is the only high-income nation not guaranteeing health care for all of its citizens. And what's interesting about this word citizens is that Black people in this country were not considered citizens until 1865. Um, and so there was, a, from slavery, there was a lot of, of um, um, uh, kind of people did not want Black people to be citizens. And of course, they could not uh, get health care. So a lot of that kind of history has brought the U.S. below the life expectancy. We have the highest instance of chronic disease, highest rate of avoidable hospitalizations, and the highest rate of avoidable deaths. Um, and if you look even careful, more carefully, under a microscope at this data, it is the brown and black people in this country who are suffering more than the non-Hispanic whites. So why is there a disproportionate number of black physicians in the United States or minoritized physicians? Well, there are two categories really that I see, pipeline problems and lack of opportunity. We can look at slavery, Indian reservations, Japanese internment even, um, and where these people have had inferior educations, they're poorly resourced minority communities. They have lack of role models, lack of knowledge of how to reach um, uh, some of these resources. And even laws creating barriers have cre uh, created um, pipeline problems, including in the Constitution, which has um, phrases about Black people being three-fifths of a person for political reasons. So um, the Flexner Report, Abraham Flexner is the father of graduate medical education. Um, in 1910, he, he um, went around the country between 1909 and 1910 and looked at about 300 medical schools and tried to find standards for political reasons. Um, but the standards we, that still exist, he annihilated um, 12 of the, I think, 15 Black um, medical schools at that time. Um, and so that also closed down a lot of opportunity for uh, Black people, at least in this country. Many of you may know that the GI Bill after World War II, um, as black soldiers fought with white soldiers, the black soldiers came back to their own country and could not reap the benefits of the GI Bill, but sent a lot of white soldiers back to get an education, get great jobs, and the VA loan, of course, was not open to black or brown people either. So we have these issues of lack of opportunity with retention, um, and mostly, in my, in my opinion, Recruitment is not such uh, is, is, is could be better, but I think retention and knowing how to set up a inclusive environment is a problem. And so work, workforce diversity matters in eliminating health care disparities. And according to the ACGME, their mission is to improve health care and population health by assessing and advancing the quality of resident physicians education through accreditation. Now, accreditation is very important here because all GME programs that are accredited need to stay accredited or you cannot graduate people, they can't take their boards, et cetera. So the ACGME is really uh, putting the screws to everybody to think about, intentionally think about increasing workforce di diversity. Um, and Tom Nask, who's the president and CEO of ACGME said recently, it is our collective duty to advocate for all of our patients and to care equally and equitably for all of our patients, even as we care about our patients. And in order to do that, we have to be culturally sensitive and have a perspective of diversity and inclusion in all of our environments. And so about five years ago, he opened the um, ACG's, ACGME's first office of diversity and inclusion. And the inaugural chair, chief of that is my good friend, Bill McDade, um, who is um, by training an anesthesiologist. He recently gave a talk at one of our GME town halls. Uh, he's uh, joined by uh, Bonnie Mason, and they're doing quite a bit to create changes in the AC GME world across the country and around the, and around the, around the, the um, world. 
Um, the common program requirements, uh, some of these are um, re really looking at intentionally uh, making programs think about diversity, inclusion, and equity. And the Clinical Learning Environment Review, which came out in 2011, is also doing the same. The Clinical Learning Environment Review is a little different because it puts hospitals on the hook for resourcing programs and GME um, for equity, healthcare quality. And you can see that healthcare quality five and healthcare quality six out of the six key performance areas where residents, fellows, and faculty must be educated on eliminating healthcare disparities and come up with initiatives to eliminate healthcare disparities. I'd like to talk about the Clinical Learning Environment Review, which is a mandate from the ACGME, before I talk about the common program requirements. Again, the clear um, site visits have been occurring since 2011. And during that time, since 2020, they've done three cycles of site visits to their 1,200 sponsoring institutions. Our sponsoring institution is UW School of Medicine, but the only hospital being site visited is UWMC. And Dean Ramsey has asked that I make sure that all of our hospitals and our entire GME community reach a certain level um, of um, all of the key performance areas. With regard to the 1,200 sponsoring institutions that ACGME has looked at, you can see that in cycle one, 96.2% of all sponsoring institutions had not, did not appear to have systemic approach to eliminating healthcare disparities. Three years later, for cycle two, the same thing. By cycle three, you can see that 20% of all sponsoring institutions site visited had developed some systemic approach to eliminating healthcare disparities. So I think that this is brilliant, what the ACGME is doing, moving people and educating our future physicians and workforce about healthcare disparities. And I think that it's really important uh, that, you know, we know that we don't really lack diversity in this country, as I showed you in the slides before. What we do lack is equity and inclusivity because of our country's history of, in, of institutional racism um, and laws that protect those who call themselves white. And I would say that the, institutes, the Institute of Medicine has let out this foundational principle. Health disparities exist because we lack the societal will to view them as a form of unacceptable healthcare quality deficiencies and apply an equity lens. So the ACGME does not expect programs to do this all at once. What they want is to see intentional and sustained efforts in reporting in their um, ACGME data system. They also do not want to see one-time single events and, and people are done. They want to see long-term initiatives that have results and result in better workforce diversity and, and decreasing healthcare disparities. Now we're going to look at common program requirements. The first is um, 4B6, which has to do with recruitment and retention. These are for all programs that it is important to, for all programs to engage with and partner with their sponsoring institution, that would be my office, to engage in practices that focus on mission-driven, ongoing systemic recruitment and retention of a diverse and inclusive workforce, which includes all trainees, faculties, administrative and leadership staff. You can see here that um, the ACGME has been really looking at this. The total number of active residents between 2018 and 2019 in core programs and in fellowships on your extreme right are listed here. And you can see that the non-Hispanic white in the first row there are, most, are, are the majority of residents and fellows. You can see that Asian and Pacific Islanders make up about 16.8% in the same number of fellowships. And you see Hispanic, Black, and Native American, and Native and Alaskan Natives make up 5.3, 4.5, and 0.2 percent, respectively. But if we look closely at the U.S. 2020 Census, we can see that Hispanic population makes up about 18 percent of the entire population, but only 5.3 percent of the physician workforce. Black Americans make up about 14% of the entire U.S. population, but only 4.5% of the U.S. workforce. Interestingly enough, you see that Asians and Pacific Islanders are overrepresented in medicine with 16.8, but only 6% of the population. 
Underrepresented in medicine, I think, is a good thing to define now. By the AAMC in 2004, URIM means those racial and ethnic populations that are underrepresented in the medical profession relative to their numbers and the general population. This is important for a number of reasons. The Institute of Medicine Study Workforce looked at diversity and how it can eliminate health disparities. And they came up with three principles. The first is that patient education programs can increase patients' knowledge about access to care and participating in their treatments. The second is cross-cultural and, sens and cultural sensitivity training of all levels and future healthcare professionals can help in increasing the proportion of underrepresented in medicine healthcare professionals. And another study Saha did in, in Archives of Internal Medicine looked at concordance theory. And in the concordance theory, according to the concordance theory, it says that when white um, people go to see, patients go to see white doctors, they value that. But even more so, black and brown patients who see black and brown doctors also value that, take their medicines better and do better have better outcomes. So the concordance theory is very important. Another reason to increase diversity in the workforce of medicine. Common program requirement 3B8 is respectful in environment. Um, programs in partnership with the sponsoring institution must provide a professional, equitable, respectful, and civil environment that is free from discrimination, sexual and other forms of harassment, mistreatment and abuse, coercion of students, and I'm going to, in the next two slides, so show you mistreatment of minority students and the mistreatment of surgical residents. The first study here is in JAMA by Catherine Hill et al. that looked at 27,000 graduates between 2016 and 2017 in the graduate questionnaire and compared, and these are medical students who are graduating, compared to white heterosexual male students Asian, Black, and Hispanic medical students reported higher rates of mistreatment and discrimination. And unfortunately, Black female medical students reported the highest prevalence of racial ethnic discrimination. It's interesting too that I'll point out that um, Black female medical students outpace Black male medical students by about six to one. So, um, and you see here in the um, uh, table uh, that, is, that accompanies this slide that 38% of black students reported mistreatment and 24 discrimination. Looking at surgical residents, the, this is a powerful study in the New England Journal of Medicine with a collaborative study look, using the American Board of Surgery, American College of Surgeons and the ACGME. What, was, what happened was um, thousands of surgeons were taking their abscite examinations, um, were given questions that were produced by the um, former, the, the uh, uh, groups that, that I mentioned above. There was a 99% response rate. And the most common findings were 44% of the uh, surgical residents responding said that patients were very high in gender discrimination and attendings were very high in sexual harassment and abuse. And you can see that mistreatment includes gender bias where um, you know, a patient may ask a female resident to please bring this tray back. Racial discrimination, physical or verbal abuse, and sexual harassment. If you we look at racial discrimination, you see that 71% of Black surgical residents um, felt responded they had racial had experienced racial discrimination. Asians were very high too at 46%. These kind of um, bad experiences that these surgical residents have caused burnout, depression, alcohol abuse, cynicism, and medical school attrition. Common program requirement 5C3 is ultimate pass rate. It used to be that the ACGME looked at the first time pass rate, but they've changed this because they have shown that 66% of the um, medical students in the US come from families in the top quintile of household incomes. And so those families that have more resources, and as I showed you, it's not really equitable. And so black and brown and minoritized folks who have not had the opportunities as have had others, um, have been able to do well on standardized examinations. 
That is not true. And the ACGME recognizes this and they've attempted to um, make this an ultimate pass rate versus the first time pass rate. So what happens when you introduce diversity into an environment where diversity has not really taken hold? And there are many areas, not only in our institution, but around the country where this is the truth. Underrepresented medicine residents and fellows need a welcoming environment like everybody. They need time for social adaptation and leaders who will look out for them and address uncivil behavior efficiently and effectively on the mistreatment we were talking about. Um, there is a reduction of environmental triggers that feed the imposter syndrome when there is implicit bias, discrimination, and devaluation of people of color or people who may be different from others in the, on the team to make um, them feel that they are not wanted. We have to deal in group and individual diversity training, but it's best to do it with who really needs it, set the expectations, and persist persistence of training for present and future workforce. There are a lot of barriers to achieving successful diversity um, and they're all listed here. It's lack of leadership, the challenge of trying to develop an institution, uh, institutional culture of inclusion in one that where it hasn't been and hasn't historically been, the challenges of modifying current recruitment practices, uh, implicit bias, um, not being the members of the selection committee not being trained in this, and lack of knowledge of how to support diversity in a learning environment. And the, the most important thing is your diversity cannot be a one-dimensional initiative which, because it typically fails. UWGME has a new mission statement and it comes from the root of UW Medicine to improve the health of the public, which is ambitious. But we've added, by fostering the professional growth of physician leaders within a supportive and dynamic culture of learning, building the foundation for a workforce that represents and enhances the communities we serve, and we've done quite a few things um, since Anamari Kause um, presented race and ethics in, and I'm sorry, um, um, and, and uh, equity in 2015. Um, Anamari Kause is the first woman president of UW, the University of Washington. She's the first lesbian in the University of Washington. She's the first immigrant of the University of Washington. And she is very committed to diversity and inclusion at this university. Um, and back in 2015, I invited or required all program directors at that time to take a four hour training by Robin D'Angelo, who just uh, published um, White Fragility about two years ago. It's a fascinating book. I would encourage anybody to read it. We have a, a GME commitment to diversity on our website. I have charged the GMEC EDI Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Subcommittee that Daniel Cabrera chairs. We also have a Graduate Medical Education Committee Clear Subcommittee that Dr. Lindy Strizich chairs. We've had various town halls over um, several years now. Bill McDade from ACGME, Dr. Cora Dudu, Black Men in White Coats, Picture Scientists with panel discussion on gender discrimination. This was about women, uh, discrimination of women in medicine and science. There are a list of things that we have here. I would encourage everybody to go to our website, look at the equity, diversity, and inclusion resources that we have there. Um, be familiar with our updated concern reporting tool, which is uh, reviewed um, every week, and we get back to people about these things. And we've also expanded our wellness services because there's a lot of burnout, particularly now. So that leads me to what you can do. There's a lot you can do because um, there, it's been shown that physicians um, lack empathy around these issues. Stereotyping, biases, and uncertainty on the part of healthcare providers can also contribute to unequal treatment. And though many studies have shown this. So we need to improve our workforce diversity to decrease, um, um, uh, to increase health equity. And so recruitment and retention by intention is something that ACGME is asking us to do. And I'm going to very briefly go through these five bullet points here. Setting diversity as a priority is important for programs, particularly during this time of recruitment um, and interview season. The clinical learning environment is not a space. It is a process of how the space does business. And I'm wondering what you would say about how your space is doing business. How are you all doing with regard to working together to make an inclusive environment and to make medical students interested in your program, not just because of the wonderful work you're doing, but because of who you are and who you want in your program. 
I put this together. I saw this slide of potions and lotions, et cetera, and thought I'd put together, um, you know, some, 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 some solutions here. Commitment to an inclusive environment is very important. Educating and teaching everybody equitably and realizing those individuals who need more uh, attention to learning. Timely, truthful feedback and honest evaluations and feedback should, should match the evaluations. This is how we um, uh, avoid discrimination, how we avoid mistrust. Empathy, Brian Stevens in his book, Just Mercy and Movie, um, talks about uh, the lack of empathy, which is why diversity um, is a, a, such a bad word to many people. We lack leadership uh, in many areas of this country with regard to diversity and improving inclusivity. And the intentionality and effective recruiting for your department needs to be, needs to have leadership, it needs to have group think and, and timely projects that will help. The NRMP is one way we get residents here. And we, can, we should seek out underrepresented medicine um, uh, residents who are what I, we, we, we talked about in previous slides, black and brown people um, and um, uh, Asian uh, Alaskan uh, natives. Um, those are the people we should be seeking uh, for diversity to increase the workforce diversity. Do you have a diversity mission statement on your website that would acknowledge and reflect what you believe um, are you participating in the network of underrepresented residents and fellows in their town halls and their education? Are you reading on your own? I'm reading 1619 Project right now, which is unbelievably good. Um, are you attending the Student National Medical Association as Howard Chansky, the chair of orthopedics did? Orthopedics is the whitest surgical subspecialty of all. Um, it has so few minorities in it that the um, um, American College of Surgeons is thinking about really coming down on them to really look at diversity. Um, speaking about the network of underrepresented residents and fellows, I was uh, very happy to be able to start this group about 14 years ago. Um, some of the black students from UW School of Medicine came to see me about when, when I became, was associate dean, um, starting um, a, a diversity an inclusion uh, group led by residents. And I, of course, said yes. And they, they conduct uh, lectures. They've been incredibly important in our recruitment, uh, holding um, 600 uh, people for a town hall. They've had, we sponsored with them Black Men in White Coats, as I said, um, and other um, uh, very important um, issues on, on race and diversity. Did your team participate? Did you participate? And then um, what about this idea of holistic review? This is recommended by the AAMC, who says that we need to really look at personalized, um, the personal statements, um, because it's very easy to do a filter um, of, of you know, um, board scores and uh, take out the lowest scores and not even consider some of those people who may not have had great standardized test scores. What is the distance traveled? Did they have three jobs? Um, did they, were they doing three leadership? Um, did they have to work to get through school or did daddy pay for them to go to school? Um, and, um, and so we look at balance needs to be given to attributes and academic accomplishments. You can't change the results if you don't change your mindset. And I think that looking at our interviewing practices, we need to train faculty and residents about implicit bias when we're looking at a group of residents. We need to include visual reminders in our interview packets about questions not to ask. Women, are you pregnant? Um, what is your religion? <laughs> um, those types of things uh, will get a program in big trouble. Um, if the, it does the program director and the chair, do they state how they are committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion? Does this show up on your website? And uh, do you refer to the GME website? Um, which has all many of these things on it. Do you have a mentorship program? And what is your program done? This is the time to create trust, um, not only among your, um, your present residents and fellows, but among the faculty. This is not a one-time deal. This is a year-round sustained process where you look at your equity diversity culture, 
you do bystander um, um, training and interventions for interventions against microaggressions and overt discrimination. And you support all residents in board prep, early research, call them up and, and, and a, you know, when it's available again, uh, chat with them about their professional identity and professional development. Um, and most importantly, I think we are seen as the ivory tower here at UW and we don't reach out to our communities. I'm very proud of um, uh, Dr. Estelle Williams, who is in charge of Doctor for a Day, where she reaches out to high schoolers um, to, to bring them to them lectures and um, black, brown and white and Asian uh, doctors to go into their high schools. We are not doing as much now because of COVID, but it's very important for black and brown people and people who are not represented in medicine to see themselves um, one day being a physician or a scientist or a researcher. So um, partner with UW Medicine's Office of Healthcare Equity if we have, as we have, and Paula Houston is very happy to join with anybody who wants to um, and is interested in projects, initiatives that would support diversity, cultural sensitivity, and better inclusivity. And I want to leave everybody with a challenge um, to, to be sure that we're all working together, but also teaching ourselves um, and not depending on our black and brown colleagues to, to, to train us or educate us. And Mahatma Gandhi said, our ability to reach unity and diversity will be the beauty and the test of our civilization. So I thank you for listening and I will take any questions and I'm, I'm sure Brooke would want me to show this here for an evaluation. I'm sure if I'm not sure if I show it now or, or later. Um, so I'm, I'm open for, for questions. I also wanna thank Brooke who's been amazing um, and very patient with me and, and very kind um, uh, host uh, as well, Dr. Tang and Dr. Schertz, thank you so much. And um, I also um, want to thank uh, Dr. Baird um, who has been a great uh, chair. I would like to start with a question. First of all, I want to say thank you uh, on behalf of the Jedi Committee, which I have the pleasure to chair. Uh, this has been an amazing list of to do that you have given us. We have a lot of things already going on, but this is definitely very inspiring, very well centered, and definitely is giving us a better roadmap of the things that we can do. So I wanted to say thank you, first of all. And then I wanted to get a bit more of your ideas in terms of uh, recruitment, which is something that we are actively doing. And we are, one thing that we are doing is trying to make a kind of a booklet for search committees. So that's something that you had mentioned as well. But the other big thing that we have more trouble with is reach out. So which are your ideas, reach out? So how do we reach to minorities? How can we do a better job putting our ads out there and targeting the people that we really want to target? A very great question. Thank you uh, very much um, for that. There are a number of things that I think that you could do um, either with your a PEC committee um, or a resident committee uh, with your committee talking about how you can reach out not only to uh, our local communities here because it, it's really great to uh, see people who grow up in Seattle and come to our university and we take and, and they, can, they can matriculate here. And I think the way to do that is to get involved with Estelle Williams who's involved with Doctor for a Day um, reaching out to high schoolers uh, about pathology and, and, and um, science. Um, and, and I think really, this is something that nobody can kind of push or shove on you. This is something that the ACGM has asked us to think about. Um, you can have a drop down menu to think about, let's see what we're gonna work on. What, how can we be successful? Some of the things that Howard Chansky and, um, and um, Ken Steinberg have done, have actually gone to the uh, SNMA, the Student National Medical Association, which is the largest and oldest black um, um, uh, organization, uh, medical organization in the country. Also the Latin Medical Student Association show up to these things um, and, and, and talk to the students there. They would be thrilled because there are very few faculty who show up. They see residents, they see medical students, 
Um, but I think if you campaigned at these places with the Stanfords and the Harvards, uh, we could do a much better job. So, you know, uh, I would I would say, think about what you want to do, put your resources toward one or two things, and really dig into those, get everybody involved, try to find out who will not only volunteer, but assign people things that they uh, that, that, that can be done. I mean, it's, you know, it, 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 it's very easy for me to say we should do this, 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 and this, but I think really individualizing it and putting your fingerprint on it as a as the depart as your department would would want to do is the best thing and involve your residents they are very nimble um, um, at, at this I think thank you and for faculty recruitment any suggestions thank you for faculty recruitment I know that Paul Ramsey uh, P Dean Ramsey, has required implicit bias training for any chair um, um, uh, that is being uh, sought for this university. And in so doing, uh, when I first started, and I, I know that Dr. Alpers and Dr. Upton um, uh, saw no black chairs. Now we have one, two <laughs> black chairs, uh, one in pediatrics and the other in, in neurology. Um, and so it's fascinating to see how when you really call and, and comb the surf, just go more than the surface, that you can really um, get candidates who are qualified and um, exceptional. Um, uh, but you, you really do need to look and you really do need to be educated and have a different mindset when you're doing these things. And it's the leadership. Those leaders at this institution will help change our environment here. The question is basically that Seattle has seen a huge increase in the cost of living over the deck over the past decade. In fact, cost of living was cited by interviewees as one of the main drawbacks of our program. In terms of residency recruitment and creation of a diverse workforce, what is the GME doing to make living and training in Seattle a viable option for trainees coming from less privileged backgrounds? Thank you for that question. Um, so I, I want to disabuse everybody of the fact that GME is responsible for financing the residents and fellows. That is absolutely and completely not true. So the cost of living is something that we are looking at and advocating for residents and fellows with Paul Ramsey and his leadership team. But GME is not responsible for paying residents. We're not responsible for setting the, the, the salaries. We're not responsible for any of the benefits that residents get. All of that comes from UW Medicine. And as we start negotiations, which are in full swing, starting at three o'clock, um, I, I, I really want to, to kind of get people's minds off of GME. GME is not negotiating with, with the residents and, and the resident union. It is the university that is negotiating the only reason GME is sitting at the table is because we are the experts in ACGME and we cannot step on anything ACGME. So what would I like to see? I would love to see um, um, better salaries. I would, because GME does not do poorly or do better if the residents get less. I'm gonna say that again. Graduate medical education does not benefit when the residents don't benefit. So, it is, I wanna make it clear that GME is not standing in the way of resident salaries or resident benefits. And I don't have any control over the cost of living um, and I would love to see the salaries go up. Um, but I think that even despite that, there are many, many uh, cities around this country that have high cost of living and we still have to do better at recruiting a diverse workforce at the University of Washington. There's another question in the chat, but I think I saw that Dr. Upton might have had her hand up to, to, to solve that question. Yes, Dr. thank you. I, I can ask it. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much. Hi, hi Dr. Joyner. Um, when I attended the NMA meeting in, in July, which actually anyone can join the NMA, it's a historically Black Medical Association, because many people don't know until 1965, Black physicians could not join the AMA. But the NMA has been around since, I think, the 1890s. 150 years. Yes, it's amazing. And um, there were quite a few fabulous presentations about recruiting 
students from historically marginalized populations. And Mercer University in Georgia is a medical school that now includes public members on their admissions committee with an equal voice to physicians. So when medical students come to interview, they automatically meet people in the community. They begin to know what churches they can go to, where they can meet allies in the business community, the professional community, et cetera. And that's been really important. And I, my question was, are any departments doing that here? I actually think it would be really strong to have public members on some of our planning committees for how we roll out testing of different types. Because if we build bridges to groups in the community around in initiatives that serve the community, we build amazing bridges that many people in our, in our professional community in Seattle from historically excluded populations are very strong, very well trained, and very strong advocates. Um, the Mary Mahoney Nursing Association is very active in Seattle. In fact, they yes. did the group that supports mental health nurse practitioners. They actually founded that. And the first, one of the first ombuds persons for University of Washington was a black woman who was also a mental health nurse. Um, so that's Lois Price Spratlin. So Spratlin. So I think that that's a, a route that we actually as a department and as a university should be considering is including public members on our, our planning for things that we're rolling out, but also in recruiting. There's no reason they cannot participate in recruiting our residents in interviewing our residents and joining our, our interview base. And I think many would be honored to be included, but that gives us immediately a relationship with the community that we, that many departments do not have currently at the University of Washington. Dr. Upton, thank you uh, for that um, advocacy of the public um, uh, trying to uh, interview and, and recruit for uh, people of color. And I think, you know, the department reaching out to um, some various members, many of you know black people or brown people, <laughs> and you can reach out to them and say, would you like to be on our committee? You know, you need to orient them, you need to educate them, with questions asked, behavioral questioning, how are you going to do it, et cetera. But it can't be a one-time thing. If you ask a, you know, a, a Hispanic person to come for one time and then you ignore them for the rest of the year, that's not a way to have a relationship. And all of these things um, kind of rotate around good relationships. And so I would say, if you're going to start that relationship, make sure you persist in it and, and make it a healthy one where you're not using somebody, but your, 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 their, their contributions are valued and you value the relationship. Other questions? Um, so Dr. Dr. Jordan, I'm just reading out some of the stuff that's in the chat. Sure. So you, you clearly point out that the, pipe, uh, the pipeline issues as a critical component of meeting our mission in achieving diversity and equity. Is there a role for the School of Medicine to build a relationship with one of the historically black universities or colleges um, in order to develop opportunities to expose or encourage these um, experiences for students? For um, yes, there are the historically black colleges and universities were actually started by uh, the um, white masters who enslaved black people to take care of their children and the communities in which they lived because white, white medical doctors would not take care of black people at that time. So um, that's just some history and background. But what I would say is that absolutely reaching out to the historically black colleges and universities is something that several of the departments have already done. Um, and, it, and it would be, I'm, I'm sure that Dr. Upton, Dr. Alpers have friends in these universities and can reach out um, and um, try to establish relationships whereby you're inviting some of their medical students you're, you're to come and do some observerships. Not now, I'm sending, we'll be sending out a travel restrictions for GME tomorrow, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when we open again, um, make sure that, you know, it, but you can't do that when COVID stops, you gotta start now. Hey, when COVID ends, I would love to invite some of your medical students to come see what we're doing in pathology here at the University of Washington. What do you think? And then set up a process. Make sure you push it through our, 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 uh, our office to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Um, and then keep the, keep the relationship open. 
I think the, the, that is a, a wonderful idea and we're certain departments are already doing that. Thank you for that question. Can I ask, um, you had mentioned um, that the ACGME was looking at ultimate pass rates versus like um, first time pass rates. And I think, you know, I, a lot of people might, or some people would say, or might be concerned about like um, the pass rates for, for boards, given that somebody might be struggle, struggle, struggling with, uh, with kind of um, being able to pass, um, you know, their, their USMLEs, et cetera. Um, what would you say to that? Um, and is that something that people should be looking for, looking at in terms of like residencies or fellowships? That's a, a very good question. And the ACGME has realized that, um, number one, um, MCAT scores and USMLE scores predict board passage rate. That is, that is true. And what I mentioned to you that two thirds of medical students in the United States come from the um, families that are in the upper quintile of household incomes, those folks get resources. And many of the students who get through medical school and get into from undergraduate and have had really hard um, roads to travel, um, they can get through, they, but they may need extra resources to, to do so because they haven't had the money to go to the, M, the, the uh, Kaplan course or to take this course or to have a private tutor or those types of things. So I think that if we recognize those early, we have a learning specialist at, in, in, our, in our GME office that can help. Um, we certainly want everyone to pass their boards. It's the goal of residency and a fellowship. But I think what the ACGME has realized is that first time pass rate giving a citation to a program is gonna say, okay, my filter is at 250. I don't want anybody coming here from 250. Well, all the 250s aren't the best doctors. So I would say that 250 is a great score, but you know, um, it certainly wasn't my score. <laughs> and the, it wasn't 250 back then, it was different, I'm sure 35 years ago, but um, I wasn't the highest scoring either. And many aren't, but, um, uh, I think if you, you, you see people and, and they've got leadership skills, they've got other attributes, they've got um, stick to itness, and those are the people you want in your program, white or black, Asian or otherwise. Um, I have a question here. Does UW randomly and independently sample minority applicants at different levels who interact with us? Um, and then also the, the disparity begins much before um, ACGME at medical school and earlier. Is UW addressing DI at the medical school and at other levels? I'm, I, I'm guessing this is like at the level of like undergraduate um, as, as well. Um, that, the question as I understand it is what are we doing to um, increase the pipeline? Um, and I will tell you that UW could be doing a lot more Doctor for a day is one way of getting to increasing the pipeline and, and letting um, minoritized uh, folks um, uh, know that they are uh, important and valued. Um, but I think what you're getting to is at a zero sum game, if we're all competing for the same small group of black and brown people, uh, that can be a problem. And, and it does, it goes way back. So I think my answer to that is, Workforce diversity, increasing that will help um, will help with um, healthcare disparities and improve health equity, and will resource younger families to 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 to, to, to um, raise children, of black and brown children who who are interested, have the resources, can make the money, et cetera, have mentors, et cetera, to get in. And so this is not going to take, you know, a year. This is going to take years and persistence and, su and, and sustaining this um, because the, the pool is small. Um, and when I say that, you know, I'm one of five black male DIOs in the country of 1,200 sponsoring institutions, I'm 60, and that's disgraceful, basically, in, 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 in my opinion. Um, that, 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 that shouldn't be. And a lot of that is poor opportunity and many of the historical things that have happened previously. It's not that we have lack of diversity here. We don't have a lack of diversity in this country. And I just shown you, I've shown you that 36% of the population is now black or brown. And still we have this dearth 
it's being given opportunities and given being given resources and being given equity, where I think a lot of black and brown and um, uh, lesbian transgender folks can can be more in the mix of our workforce. Can I ask a question, uh, Hamilton? Certainly. You know, uh, Dr. Joyner, this is Nadim Zafar from the VA. Hi. We talked about hi. We talked about Mercer and contacting other feeding institutions, potentially getting partnerships. But before doing that, I would also consider partnering with our own high schools in the city. For God's sake, they need to come and they need to visit us to see what we do out here and that they are so welcome out here. And if we, there is disparity within school, the school that my son went to is one of the best schools and it's a predominantly white school. So I think that's the first, that's a very low hanging fruit that we must address, we must approach. And then uh, they, because there's a lot of disparity at the school level in the city. And that's I would, something which can be very, very useful for bringing talent down the line and uh, loyalty to the system, respect for UW and all of that basically. Dr. Zafar, thank you very much. And I absolutely agree with you. I think that a lot of universities uh, with its ivory towers don't reach out to our communities, especially if black and brown, we're reaching out for the, to them for advancement and to the rich and privileged. But I think one of the things that we should do is, is try to reach out, find those communities, develop those relationships, go to the high schools, find out who the teachers are and see if you can, can, um, can support Dr. Estelle Williams, who's in the Department of Surgery, who went through medical school here, and she would be happy to tell you her story. Um, she did not come from rich parents. She came from um, a, a very, very poor um, um, California um, city and um, made it through opportunities and working really, really hard. And she is giving back um, in big ways to our communities here and to bringing up young junior and high school or uh, high school boys and girls um, in minoritized um, uh, high schools to make sure that they feel valued and they feel resourced and they feel cared for. Um, and that's, that's the way to develop our community around here. I've been involved in many, Dr. Forday, I've given lectures there, I've shown how to use an ultrasound, <laughs> um, you know, um, and showing up and, and, and just making sure that people see that there are others like them. And I think that is very hard for majority whites to understand. Why can't you just pull up your bootstraps and get going? Opportunities um, and, and historical issues have caused a lot of problems in the black and brown communities in this country and not recognizing that is, is, is a big problem. So, and thank you for that. The final thought on this one is it's not just the medical school. We are also gonna be terribly short staffed for our medical technologists other ancillary fields. And if we, I think that a holistic approach can help entire healthcare infrastructure. And eventually some of them will come up, the med, these med techs will come up to be pathologists also. I absolutely agree with you. And I think it, it, the, the, the goal is to get people to where they want to be and to the, to, the, to, the, to the height of what they want to do. Not everybody has to be a doctor. Um, but researchers, uh, PhDs, scientists, you know, technologists, uh, they would even get interested in IT. Um, but, I, but I think seeing people who care about them, and I think that is, you know, one of the reasons that we all went into our specialty. A urologist cared about me, and I felt that, and I, and I, and I liked urology, obviously. So that's, that's what I chose to do. But it really is about a personal um, connection. Um, and, and I think that's what we all should all reach for. And I really appreciate all of your questions um, and I wanna respect your time. Um, so if there, if there may be one more question, I'm more than happy to answer it. And thank you for all being on camera. I, 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 I told Dr. Tsang earlier that a lot of these um, lectures are given and, and everybody is falling asleep or not paying attention. And it's, it, it, <laughs> I mean, giving electron bio biology is bad enough, but on something like discrimination, racism, um, it, it's, it, it, it's offensive if people aren't paying attention and on screen. Anyway, <laughs> other questions? Yeah, it seems like a lot of the questions in the chat are somewhat related to each other. I was looking at Dr. Cookson's question, Dr. Alper's comment. So I don't know if maybe I can tie them together for the sure. purpose of time, but is it helpful to, you talked about the pipeline is, and I was more familiar with gender pipeline when I was a graduate student and haven't 
linked it into it that much, you know, in terms of who gets R01s or who goes to graduate school, who graduates graduate school. Is it helpful to think about that based on the data and numbers, or should we just broadly hope to make a difference in the way we think we can? You know, uh, uh, Dr. Eckel, thank you so much for your question. And this is a, a, a really um, good nuanced question. That question has led to the status quo over and over and over again. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Everybody wants to see the data. The data is quite obviously out there. It is very starkingly, dramatically out there. And I think that if we all individually put our minds together um, and then think about what we can do, the you in all of this connection is going to be what's most important. And so um, talking about increasing the pipeline for black and brown folks and for women and for men in gynecology, OB and OBGYN, if you will, because they have a hard time getting, getting men in OBGYN, for example, um, that would be diversity in OBGYN. But I think that you know uh, the data is there. And so if you continue, well, there's more data and more data has been something that has crippled um, our, our initiatives with more money and resources that could be put toward black and brown people in this country rather than more data, more data. I hope that comes close to answering your question. Um, and if not, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to have you clarify. Okay, I think that we're pretty much at time. Thank you very much, Dr. Joyner, and thank you for everyone for participating. I really appreciate it. It's nice to see everybody. And thank you for all that you're doing. Um, it's tremendous. Hang in there. We'll get through this together. And uh, if there's anything you need from my office, please let me know. We're always available uh, to help our GME community. Thank you.